Yes, sir. Okay, folks, we are on, and we are going to be just uh, checking here to make sure our sound is working properly before we get started. Can I do the hey, hey folks? I'm about to. to I'm about to record out there too. It's going to be pretty funny. You want to come make a cameo real quick? We're, it, we're on live. We're actually you're live, live. Yes, thanks a lot. But you can't see yourself yet because it's a delay. But you can come stand behind us and say hi. Oh, All man, right. look at this. I All get right. to be oh. on the dice tower again <laughs> twice in like two weeks. That is really, really <laughs> over your limit, sir. <laughs> so he's actually recording his podcast. Actually, um, we're going to be recording uh, the Dology podcast with Mike Fitzgerald and Jeff Engelstein from an undisclosed location in New Jersey. They Can invited I? me on. They, they do that occasionally, unlike some people I've with 400 episodes to be on. Hey, guys, how's it going? I'm going to be on your show. So can, I be, can I go on your show, too, after this? Yeah, yeah, All right. great. All right. great. I'll be there. Awesome. Right. They say you can see and hear us, so let's get right. started. All right. Um, get out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Bye, wow. guys. You're <laughs> taking Stephen's time. Get wow, out. that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> all right, so folks, um, uh, don't forget, and please remember a couple things. One, there is going to be a delay between probably our voice and sound, and that's, um, our voice and sound, between the sound and the video, and that's because of the internet connection here, I think. Um, and also, if you have any questions, type them in, and we may or may not answer that, but I'll try to get to as many as we can. So we're going to start out here um, today. We're talking with Stephen Glenn here. Morning. And you are, I don't even know what you're best known for now. I would like, I mean, it's probably Balloon Cup. Probably. But what it should be is first and goal. I, that's true, too. That's a, a football game. That's right. uh, we were talking to Mike yesterday about uh, baseball because he designed uh, baseball sure. highlights and sure. the difficulties of a sports game and how they don't sell as well as other themed games. I guess that's true. That, but uh, this one actually has uh, gained a bit of traction. I mean, there's a Twitter feed that is actually dedicated to a first and goal league in Australia. which is In Australia? Which is, yeah, that's which kind is of really ironic. neat. Yeah, I'm huge in Australia. <laughs> You're Australian. I'm the audience everywhere. is probably going to, you know, balloon. <laughs> well, I mean, first and goal, I want to talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Sure. Designing a football game with dice. Sure, yeah. What, what kind of brought, I mean, you might, do you like football? Of course. I'm a, I'm a long-suffering Miami Dolphins fan. I know you're from Florida, so. I understand the feeling, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Even in Miami, no one talks about sure. the Dolphins anymore. Right. They're like, oh, right. the Heat are playing soon. Oh, boy. So uh, I was a fan of football strategy, the old Avalon Hill game, and I just happened to be on the Geek one day, and I noticed someone had made cards for uh, football strategy. Uh, if you've ever played I don't know if you have. It's a wonderful game. If you haven't, I suggest it. I have not. It's just got a, uh, a template. It's uh, you, you have an offensive play, you have a defensive play, and then you do and figure out what the result is, but somebody had made cards, so you didn't have to look at that table. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. And that sort of uh, led me to think, well, what if the result wasn't uh, a definite result, like it's always going to be 20 yards, but maybe you had a, it was around 20 yards, but you had a range. And that would be uh, great to do with dice. So really, that's, that was the, uh, the inspiration from it. And then you made many expansions for and it, then I made, which lets some big variety between the teams. Correct, because it was pretty easy to make expansions. Once we had the standard oh. dice, we thought, well, it, that would be a great way to, uh, to make teams for it would just be to change the values on the dice and uh, make some teams better at passing, better at running, better at defense. So, yeah, it worked out really, really well. I'm very, very happy with it. Now, you're also known for, or you should be known, for party game design. Yes, um, I have done some party games, sure. You Must Be an Idiot, that's the name of the yep, game. Yep, um, that's right. I think you made that name just so that it would be problematic in conversation. I, sure, you know, I, I want to piss a few people off. That's never been... Uh, you know, a problem for me, but and I, I actually have a uh, a cousin who wouldn't play it because it was called "You Must Be an Idiot," so we had to sort of change the rules for her. And uh, sure, that uh, pluck and pears. Right. Uh, Someone just asked, pants is there an expansion fire. coming out for pluck and for, pears? I don't know. I, I could talk to Frank DeLorenzo about it. He's the owner of uh, R and R Games, but uh, that's great that people want it. Uh, rock band name generator? Is that you? Mm, no. I don't know why I someone's don't know saying what that. that is, but I love Rock Band. That's one of my top <laughs> ten games of all time. But lately, you've been making games that are not party games or football games. Sure. Let's talk about some of them. You brought a couple with you. Okay. So first is Spike. First is Spike. Do I have? Do we have room for to show this? I, yeah, I think so. I don't so. know if that's going to come up. I can't even. There okay. we go. All right. Now uh, this is a train game. 
Now, what, what, what prompted you to create a train game? I know there's very few in yep. existence, but what made you decide that, that was a genre? Oh, you wanted now to see, this is now I should have, I should have thought uh, better about this. I should have showed Loomis first, which we'll get to, which is a two-player uh, connection game. It was actually uh, inspired sort of by Loomis, which we'll talk about in a moment. Should. All right, okay, all we, right. We, this is a new Cos no order here. This is a new Cosmos two or four-player game, Loomis. So this is actually not available in America. Not yet, yeah. um, but and, I, and I, but I hope it will be. But I don't have any definite information about when it will be available. But it uh, it is it has a connection theme. It's not theme. It's an it's an abstract. Yeah, we played games like X or Twix. But uh, you're placing pieces on the board, trying to get from one side of a rhombus to another side of the rhombus, while your opponents are trying to do the same thing, uh, crisscrossing you. Right. So, but you have little colored spaces on the board, and you f you fill those colored spaces on the board by playing colored cards. So that was actually designed first, and then I thought, well, that would be a really neat uh, way to do a train game using that same system, uh, very much inspired by the Ticket to Ride, you know, playing a card to match spaces on the board. So I'm heavily indebted to the that uh, Ticket to Ride for, for both of these. But I will say, when I play Spike, yes. it felt like Empire Builder. Yes, that was... But for people who... Could easily play a game like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, Empire Builder is a favorite of mine and my group, but it takes a long time, it and uh, you have to use crowns, and that's always been kind of a drag. It's not the it's not the best type of way uh, to play a, a game, you know, drawing on the board. But it's all we had for a long time, so this is actually a uh, a way to play that type of pick up and deliver game. You're building the tracks on the board using cards, very but ticket to ride ish, and then uh, delivering. Picking up and delivering goods on the uh, table, which was your favorite pick up and deliver game? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I really, I really do like. Which Spike. was really cool. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. But and, the yes. yeah, well, no, I find it interesting because you make these different types of games. Yep. But we'll talk about that in a moment. And don't forget, guys, you can ask questions. Let's talk about Rattlebones since this is okay. You're. I can do that. This is uh, design that you've been working on. I know you were working on this for a while because I remember you texting me. Well, or instant messaging me way back. This is my baby, and it is a game that I designed back in 2008, 2009. I actually sold it at the Gathering of Friends to Rio Grande Games. I mean, at, at uh, to Rio Grande Games in uh, 2009, and it is the the, uh, the basic uh, mechanism is taking physical dice mm -hmm. that have removable sides, which was a bit of a problem. It was manufacturing a big way. problem. Yes. Uh, and you remove the sides and you replace them throughout the game, adding different sides. So when you roll the die, it's actually a physically new die. Right. Which was inspired by uh, Dominion, which was a favorite of mine, huge favorite of mine, top ten game. And we were playing it at a game day, and one of my friends said, wouldn't it be neat if there was a dice-building game? And I said, yeah, it sure would. Thanks. You know, cause. So the original idea that I had sort of looked more like... Um, Quarriers. That's that's when I thought dice building games. So I tried a, a version of Quarriers, where you would pull dice out of a bag and then buy them, and that didn't work. I couldn't get that to work to my satisfaction. But uh, eventually it occurred to me, what about actually building the dice, the physical die? So I made uh, I bought little wooden cubes from the craft store and uh, used Velcro and little pieces of paper for the sides. The dice were about this big. <laughs> but just I mean, physically, that's how big they had to be for me to make this <laughs> prototype, and they bounced when you rolled them, going, going, going. So I brought that here, um, 2009, and played it and got a great reception from it. And but nobody wanted to publish it. I showed it to a lot of big companies, and they just said, "Well, we like it. We're, we, it's new. We've never seen anything like this, but we, we just can't afford to do this." Mm. So fortunately, Dale Yu was standing next to one of my. Uh, play test sessions and he ran over and got Jay Tummelson who came over and asked me to show it to him and I showed it to Jay Tummelson and he bought it on the spot. One of those where he reached across the table and he said, he shook my hand and he said, I like the publisher game. This happens with all your games, right? No, that's never happened <laughs> before or after. That was a, that was a huge moment. That's what, that's what, that's the dream. So it took, a, it's, I mean, six years. For, from the moment I shook his hand and sold it to the moment that it uh, arrived, five and a half, on my doorstep, and 
It's one I've been waiting for and for a long time, and I'm so happy it's available. And people seem to really be having a fun time with it. Most people think it's uh, a lot of fun. Some people, um, I, one person in particular, I don't remember his name, but I'm a big fan of his, said it was his most hated, was it hated, game of all time? Okay, but to be clear, he's not talking about me. No, I'm not talking about Tom Vassell. Uh, gosh, his name escaped me. It's on the tip of my tongue. Okay. Anyway. Now, now you said this was a dream of yours, but another... I, I'm, I'm done talking about that. I, okay. okay. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you said this was a big dream of yours, but you almost yes. accomplished another dream, which I bet you didn't even imagine when you made Balloon Cup and it was nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. Yes, I was actually nominated. I was the token two-player nomination for the Spiel des Jahres that year. I uh, knew I had no hope of winning, but, it, you know, as they say, and this is true, it's an honor to be nominated, and I can always say I'm a Spiel des Jahres nominated designer. Were you surprised to find out you were nominated? Absolutely, of course. How did you find out? Uh, I think uh, Peter Serrett, who used to run the, the game report, uh, sent me an email. This was, um, what was that, 2003? And uh, so, sure, great. I, I was over the moon, you know, when I found out about it. I think Alhambra won that year, which was... Um, That's a tough one to go up against. Sure, of course it is. And again, it's, it's a, it, it was the, the two-player game... Well, back then they were doing five nominees, and it almost always was one two-player, right? Right. So, but I have the certificate. Did, did you go to the ceremony? Absolutely not. That's in, <laughs> that's in another whole country where I, you'd have to fly in one of those little tubes that go over the ocean. Are you kidding me? Well, no, no, sir. But uh, it was, uh, it was, it was great. And like I said, I've got the certificate on my bookshelf, and whenever I, you know, whenever you're feeling bad, about whenever I feel designer. bad about myself. You know, I'll go in there and I'll just uh, look at that and remind myself, you know, I did that. Well, it's pretty impressive because the game has lasted a while. I mean, it's out yeah. now in a new form. Sure. Uh, the Pinata, I think, is the new yes. name. Right? Yeah. Yes, Pinata, which actually fixes, um, well, the, the theme. Because I, I thought it was a pretty neat little theme. I thought of the theme first after my daughter had a Pinata party in, in our backyard. Mm. And I just saw the kids grabbing candy. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat if you had a game where you're, you're, you're grabbing candy? And you're trying right. to score it. So thematically, I think it works. I don't know. I have no idea what Balloon Cup means. But, uh, but you anyway. know, it's really interesting. When Balloon Cup came out, yes. this was one of the first times I saw an Internet stirring about a quote-unquote broken game that would happen one out of a thousand times or whatever. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing because it was something that never even happened in any of your games, right? Well, that was my first published design. Oh, I'm not criticizing. No, no, no. Um, but in fact, uh, Balloon Cup, I think, was um, oh, Sam Healy. That's his name. <laughs> I think that was his number 10 most hated game of all time. So I just want to say, I'm going to look right into the camera here. You say it's right there? Yes. I want to apologize to Sam Healy. I am a big fan. I am a huge fan. He's one of the uh, most entertaining people on your show. And I'm not kidding. Uh, because I sat down and I watched that. It, there was snow on the ground. I was off of work that day. So I thought, well, this is going to be fun. Let's see who they get. So it just turned out to be me. So, I, you know, I can't, uh, you know, that, that's the way it goes sometimes. But I, I do uh, want to... I disagree. I do want to apologize for being responsible for 20% of Sam Healy's hated games of all time. But I am working on a game specifically for Sam Healy. This is no joke. This okay. is no joke. And it's got aliens, it's got spaceships, and I just played it yesterday with Kevin Wilson, who gave me some great ideas. So I'm hoping I'm going to get into your favor with this one. So look for it soon. Man, it's cool to have that kind of power, Sam. You're so lucky. Yeah. All right, uh, Chris here says Love you, you were influential in forming a protospiel. Yes. So what do you think of the new Unpub events? I've never been to one, but I think it's great. I mean, any, any sort of... Um, environment where people who are designing games uh, who don't have access to play testers or people that can give them quality feedback, you know, mm. other than family and friends, can uh, can get that. I've, I've never been to an unpub, but yeah. Uh, well, how do you play test your games then? I have a very small group who is getting smaller. Um, Evan Derrick, mm -hmm. uh, Dark Moon fame, the game that's coming out from Stronghold Games this right. summer, uh, is actually one of my was one of my key playtesters for Spike and and uh, Loomis. I didn't know him when Rattlebones was uh, being playtested, but um, yeah, few few opportunities 
uh, to, to play test now. But, um, you know, you, you, find, uh, you find times to get together. But uh, Dominic Krapuschetz, who is the um, yeah. owner of North Star Game, and uh, another designer named Mike Petty uh, and I, and also Greg Daigle, the designer of Hawaii, was uh, we were sort of the first protospiel uh, members and got that together. I believe it was 2001 or 2002, and it grew for there, and I, I couldn't be happier. I think it's great. Yeah, it's really interesting how the design process has grown, and you're, yeah. you're seeing it now. Um, do you have any games coming up? I have a... Besides the Healy please Besides, yes, the uh, Aliens and Spaceships, Tom. You're going to like it, too. It's really, it's. Really, I don't think I've disliked one of your games it's yet. It's really fun. Um, I hope that's true. Let's not try let's to. Just let's just leave it. At yeah, that. let's just leave it at that. Let's not <laughs> dig too deep into that uh, pile of bones. But uh, uh, Gobblestones. I think I can say this. I'm gonna say it. Oh, it's too late. It's live. Go- Gobblestones <laughs> from R and R is uh, coming out this summer. Okay. And that's um, for any Quirkle fans out there. I love Quirkle. Mm-hmm. I love Scrabble. I think Scra- Scrabble is. Uh, one of my top games of all time. Well, I was I've, with you at I've probably, I've probably played more games of Scrabble. Um, I've, I've played over a thousand games of Scrabble. This is face to face. This is not online. Wow. It's got, it's got tremendous replayability. So I love Quirkle for when you want a lighter version of Scrabble. So yeah. Gobblestones, go, yeah, okay, Gobblestones is, I'm looking at Rattlebones and saying Gobblestones and getting all screwed up. But Gobblestones is probably my um, homage to Quirkle. Because I, I love it so much. So it's it's quirkalish and coming out this summer. Um, nothing else that I can talk about. I I am very close to selling a design that I pitched this week. And it's a very, very light uh, children's family game. Two to four players. Um, Are you working on expansions for any of your games, maybe? Uh, I would love to start working on expansions for Rattlebones because right. I've had... I've, I've got enough material for two expansions for over five years now, so I'm just waiting on the word That's from true. Rio Grande to say, you know, we've sold enough to uh, to uh, justify it, so buy Rattlebones. Tell your friends about Rattlebones. It's really cool. Um, gosh, no, I'm not, I haven't done a lot of expansions for my games, except first and goal, where the expansions came out. They all came out at the same came time. Came out at the same time. They're basically different teams. Uh, maybe a... Sixth color for Balloon Cup or Pinata, maybe. Um, <laughs> Loomis really isn't an expansion. Now he's just making it. stuff up. Oh, uh, uh, Frank does want me to work on a uh, Western map for Spike. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, and maybe when, if you could put the two together. Ooh. Yeah, and maybe play the whole country. But Ooh. but see, that that's still in the uh, larval stages. I haven't really um, got anything specific. So yeah. Fun all stuff. right. Well, I think we've got to all the questions. Oh, do you have any thoughts? Oh, okay. Do you have any thoughts about using a dice building mechanism that you use with Rattlebones for a more complex game? That is something that I was hoping would happen, because this really is sort of almost. And, and someone said this on the, uh, the comments. It's really just above proof of concept. You know, like this concept can work. What's amazing, Tom, is that these dice have existed since the early '90s. Uh, they, really? were, they were invented by a man called Dirk Lorisons. He's in Belgium. And but when I, when I uh, designed the game, I didn't know that anything like that existed. So we were at a playtest session with my group, and somebody said, you know, I've got dice that do that. So we brought them in, and I said, wow, this is exactly what we need. How have these existed for almost, you know, 15 years, and no one has made a game using them? Uh, the, uh, the designer, I think, made a small game. I think it was Airplane or Airport. You can find it on the Geek. But uh, it was... Really small, it came in a baggie, and the game or that mechanism just sort of laid dormant for you know over a decade, which is astounding to me that some designer didn't see it and say, I've got to make a game with that now. Yeah, I think if I saw it, I would just be yeah. take it to someone and say, Make a game, absolutely. So, uh, yes, I am not a f- big fan of heavier games, so I don't tend to design heavier games, but I would love to see heavier games using this mechanism because I think it's. I mean, the, the, the number of things you could do with this idea is wide open. Right. And I would encourage anyone to, you know, buy a copy of Rattlebones and use them to play test your, <laughs> your idea. Now you're just getting desperate. <laughs> right. 
All right. Well, you know what? I really appreciate the games you've designed. I appreciate you well, coming on the show today. Certainly. I appreciate you having me here. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Guys, thanks for watching. Hang on. I'm going to put you on mute for just a moment. We'll right. set up our next interview. Free and clear. All right. Now I feel like I'm at home with a baby crying in the background. <laughs> okay. Uh, we now have Sean Brown from Mr. B Games with us. Welcome to the show, sir. Howdy, howdy. Now, Sean is a designer, but also a... I think you're more of a publisher at this point. Yeah, you're I, everything. I, I jumped the shark, right? <laughs> now, you, we were talking yesterday about how you have a long history. You were... You worked in uh, the car industry, and you were a teacher, yeah. and then finally got into the game industry, and you like that a little bit more than the others. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you started out working for uh, Eagle Griffin? Uh, no, I actually Eagle started out for Eagle Games Yeah, when Glenn Drover owned Eagle. It's then, really uh, confusing as to <laughs> that company's history. Um, yeah, so they were Eagle. Confusing. And then and they were Eagle Griffin. And actually, they were Eagle, then they were Fred, and now they're Eagle Griffin. That's right. But for a while, you were the face of the company a bit. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you've been on the show before. You were on our live show and things. But you, you went off on your own. What prompted you to say... I want to be a new publisher. <laughs> you know, the world doesn't have enough publishers. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, uh, it, it was just, I've always been into this. Uh, mm -hmm. At six years old, my brother got Redbox D&D. &D. You know, so I've been hooked playing games since then. And, uh, you know, along the way, we got into all the Game Master series in the 80s. Uh, and played games through the 90s, high school, college, all that good stuff. You know, I went to college like you're supposed to, got a degree, started working, still played games. And then at some point I designed a game like 2003, 2004, and I submitted it to all the like 10 publishers that existed back then, <laughs> right? And it just kept going down the circuit, going what down the circuit. What was that game? Uh, that game was called Terraforming. Hmm. Did it's, someone pick that up? No. So I actually self-published it. Oh, okay. Right? And that's how Mr. B started. And I couldn't come up with a name for a company. And I was like... All the good ones were taken. Well, yeah, and I was, at the time, right, 10 companies. And I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And I was sitting in class at the end of, well, it was the end of class, and I was grading some papers. And mm -hmm. I was trying, I was brainstorming, I was writing things down on a piece of paper, and these kids kept coming up, hey, Mr. B, can we do this? I'm like, yeah, sure, go away. I'm trying to think of the company for my, my name for my new company, right? <laughs> and I, over and over again, I kept hearing, Mr. B, Mr. B. And I was like, I got to put something on here today. Why would people call you Mr. B anyway? It's not like Brown is a hard name to well, say. We had three teachers named Brown. At the college, ah. right? So, so they all had to come up with that. One guy was there before me, so he was Mr. Brown, and one guy I don't remember what they called him. They called him Sparky or something, and then they had me, and they were like, "Well, what do we call this guy?" So we call him Mr. B, and it stuck. And you know, and it wasn't even for probably seven more years that my wife one day goes, "You need a mascot," and I'm like, "Well, yeah, I do. I have a little flying letter B," and she's like, "Well, why don't you make it a B?" And I'm like, "It is a B," and we got in this big debate, and I never saw the <laughs> obvious, like, "Why don't I make it a B?" <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody drew one, and they sent it to me, and I said, oh, it looks great. And I threw it on some shirts, and I started going along, and then Alan Moon sees it right away, and he's like, oh, cool logo, nice wasp. And I'm like, is that really a wasp? And he's like, are you confused? And I'm like, well, I'm not a bee, and it's a letter, right? It's not supposed to be an animal. I'm like, why? I should have made it a snake. So That is a know. wasp. It, maybe. Somebody said something about a thorax. I'm like, you know, maybe he's just too angry, and he doesn't realize he's not a bee. I don't All know, right, so anyhow, thanks for that <laughs> yeah. enlightening thing there. Yeah, exactly. Don't forget, folks, if you are um, watching, you can um, Fast ask questions that. in there. <laughs> you can ask questions, and uh, we, we will try to get to them. But let's talk about, so Mr. B started uh, almost two years ago. Yep. And you, your first game was, was it Spurs? Your first Alien game? Uprising. Oh, yep. Alien Uprising. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I think, didn't Spurs like come out a little bit earlier? Yeah, Spurs actually released before Alien Uprising. Right. So, yeah, I, it, Spurs came out at Origins. And then uh, Alien Uprising came out at Gen Con. So as a brand new company, you embraced the Kickstarter route. What was your reasoning behind that? Uh, <laughs> all of my capital was tied up 
where I used to be, and uh, I had gone to multiple banks with a very, very solid business plan, uh, plenty of years of experience in my industry, right? Uh, previously published, self-published designs, right? Mm -hmm. It's just perfect portfolio, and the banks were like, well, we'll give you a $5,000 line of credit, and like, well, you can't print anything, for, but maybe a card game for that. And, right. You know, uh, I'd been doing Kickstarters for, at that point, a couple of years where I used to work, and uh, I said, well, I'll just put one up. You know, and at the time, Kickstarters weren't making that much money. Zombicide was like the biggest one ever, and it was like 230000 which we were like, oh my God, that's insane, right? That was unheard of for somebody. And I thought, oh, gosh, man, if we could get 15000 20000 of it, I can come up with ten or twenty on my own to make it, right? And it did that in four hours, and it went over hundred k. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Some relief, some, you know, some early relief. I can actually dive in here and, and, and give this a whirl. Well, how did you persuade, I mean, to get your first company, you need a good game. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. So you got Richard Lonius. So how'd yeah. that work out? Uh, you know, I've known Richard for several years. We've worked together on a lot of different things. I've helped him as a developer, and uh, I've been gracious and lucky enough that Richard at one point told me, he said Kevin Wilson and myself were his two favorite design, uh, developers. Mm -hmm. And so when he heard I was leaving, he said, I have a design. He just walked up to me, and he handed me a game. And I said, okay, I'll take a look at it or whatever. And he said, no, that's my gift to you is this game. I want you to develop it, work it out. I want you to put your name on the box with me. Help me work out the kinks. I've been stuck on it for several years. I can't get it 100% to final. If you can fix it, you can put it out and publish it, and we'll work out all the details later. And, I mean, I can't. I owe that guy, you know, he's one of the most kindest gentlemen I've ever met in my life. Which is a very true statement. <laughs> Um, so then you, you, you've had several games that have come out. Um, you have one on Kickstarter right now? Uh, yeah, I do. I have a game on uh, Kickstarter right now called Post Human. Some people uh, here are asking about it, <laughs> and they wanted you to talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, so Post Human has been one of these whirlwinds. Uh, the, the folks from Mighty Box Games actually are the development studio and the designers behind it. Uh, they actually reached out to me at uh, some point, and uh, I guess they reached out to several publishers, and they sent them all a pitch sheet and said, hey, here's our game. And I actually looked at it and I said, cool, send me a rule book or whatever. You know, it looks pretty cool. And uh, they sent it to me. I read it. And I said, wow, this is fantastic. Can you guys send me a prototype? I'd love to play it. They said, sure. They sent me a prototype. You know, it got there in like a week. I got it in the mail. I opened it up. I do what I always do with prototypes. I read through the setup. I set up a game. I look at the mechanics for a couple of turns. If I like it, I'll leave it set up. I'll go read the rule book very thoroughly. And they'll come back and give it a solid play. Because I can generally tell from, from the pitch sheet and, and everything else if this is going to be something I'm going to be interested in. I never left the table. I played it completely through. I found zero issues. with And with me being a developer, I find issues with everything. Mm -hmm. I found nothing that I disliked except for one like major, major tiny thing. I minor. called those guys. Minor thing. <laughs> I called those guys on Skype. And I told them, I love this game, you know, sans one little tiny, tiny thing. They asked what it was. I told them. I said, okay. They kind of said some things in Maltese, which is their local language to each other. And I thought, uh-oh, that wasn't good. And then they said, we agree. You're, that's really smart. You, <laughs> we want to test it. And I was like, well, I'm not saying you should change it. I'm just saying it was a suggestion. That we'll, we'll test it. And three days later, we had a contract. And we were ready to go. And, uh, you know, the artwork and... Everything that they had presented was so good. I was like, you know, we'll just put this up. I mean, I, there's not much I have to do. And, uh, you know, I threw it up, and we were expecting to get... We put it up for 27000 We were expecting to get 35 maybe. We planned stretch goals to fifty k, And uh, I told them, hey, sometimes these things can take off on a life of their own. And maybe we should have some backup goals. And they said, oh, okay, that's, that's silly. And I said, I agree it's silly, but let's just back of an envelope sketch down some things that we might be able to do if it were to go to 100 or so and it's over 200 today as it sits yeah, and as I we just, look at it, it's 217 I, I, and i i'm just i'm this game better be good amazed and honored and baffled and you know i mean not baffled but i mean it it's a labor of love and it's awesome that people are that you know we put out a few games people are paying attention they're excited and they're uh so this we, says here check stuff out. And hopefully we're getting better too october yeah, so we're trying to get that for Essen. That's that's our, our target, which I haven't been to Essen on my own in two years. And uh, I was thinking year three would be Essen, not year two. But 
you a lot of support from Europeans, so uh, I feel like we need to go for post-human. Uh, right. You know, let alone everything else. Someone says, is there a solo? Is there going to be a solo variant in the game? Uh, there is going to be a solo variant. So Gordon uh, Kalea, the designer, is working on um, something like that. It's it's mostly, I've played it solo the first time. Uh, and the solo game doesn't have, like, the, there's a mutant that basically what happens is as you take scars in the game, uh, you become mutated. And if you get too mutated, then you actually switch into a mutant. And then your goal is to stop all other humans from getting to the safe haven or the fortress. And so uh, in the solo game, if you mutate, you're just done and you lose. Ah, so you okay. have to get to the fortress. And if you can't withstand all the scars, then you're out. And it's actually quite challenging because they ratcheted it up just a hair on solo because obviously you don't have people messing with you. <laughs> right? And, and it's, it, to me, it's still very rewarding. It, it plays... Very much like a video game RPG, um, like a, a Fallout or something like that. Oh, that's and that's cool. what really sucked me in. And, and I tell this story of I was working with a designer, Carrie Grayson, who did Pandemic Contagion, right? He's, he's a pretty good friend of mine. And uh, we were working on a post-apocalyptic, a post-apocalyptic survival type game. And we'd been working on it for maybe a year, year and a half. And uh, when I saw this, I had to call him and I was like, look, man, you, you know our game is far from from complete right and he said yeah and i I got pitched this game post-human and it's phenomenal and he goes well our game sucks so like you know (laughs) you should just shelf it right and put out the better game and that's what i love about working with designers is sometimes you know we get a good idea and we work on it and sometimes we go you know there's something better than what we have so let's not even bother bringing it to market let's let's take that energy and maybe some of the cool mechanics and let's focus on a new game that the market doesn't have or that there's a space for us right you know and, and that's kind of that whole story. Chris says that Spurs has a great box cover. Which oh, he does. Yeah. He says, does that does that any of that art direction come from the publisher or the designer, or is it just the vision of the artist? How would that work? So let's say you're commissioning a box cover. How does that work? So normally uh, I, I get the input of the designer quite a bit on, on what they like for art. With Spurs, it was interesting because uh, Oli had, had reached out to me and said, hey, I've got this really cool Western game. We had this connection where we kind of both grew up on American Western TV. You know, it's a very stereotypical. Right. Which even, you know, he's in Denmark and thousands of miles away from me. He got the reruns. And, and so we had this instant connection. And we just felt we want to portray that good and the bad and the ugly look and feel of a Western. And I was looking around and I was calling artists and checking out things. And I actually found uh, Gino, who, who did that cover. And I saw that and I was like, God, that would be a great cover for Spurs. The piece already existed. Ah. And I thought that would be awesome. I, I wonder if I could inquire. And I inquired and, and he said, oh, I'm retired. I don't do work anymore. And um, you know, there's a trust that owns all of my work because he's, he's very old. He's in his 90s. Oh, wow. Uh, he's been painting uh, Spaghetti Western posters in Italy for you know, 35 years kind of a thing. Hmm. And so I contacted the estate trust and they were like, sure, we can license you all of his art portfolio to use in games. I was like, what? great. Not just the picture, but all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all of Spurs, well, not all of Spurs, but 50% of Spurs art is his works. That's pretty neat. And I was like, this, this is fantastic. And then the, the stuff we couldn't create, like obviously he didn't draw a city with little buildings to visit. So we just hired a, a, a Jason Carr to illustrate all that. And we showed Jason Gino's style. And Jason said, oh, I can copy that. And voila, we had Spurs. And uh, I love Spurs. For me, it's quick, fast, dirty. I, I, I've been with you guys before. I love to mess with Eric in it. It's maybe one of my favorite pastimes. It's one of my favorite moments in gaming. Um, now, you just came out with an expansion for Spurs. Yep, yep. And you talked earlier about being a developer. Someone said, what's what's an essential skill to being a developer? Oh, geez. You know, it's. I, I tell people the analogy of you have to be willing to be very open-minded. For me, I, I hate – I feel like when a designer brings me a piece of work – that it's not my job to like just cut it apart like an editor. Mm-hmm. It's my job to try to keep it as clean and close and true to their vision as possible, but just clean up the ambiguities and, and, and the rules, loopholes, and things like that. And anytime I see something, I, uh, I look at it, I look at it very, very closely, and then I call the designer, I talk to the designer, and I say, hey, uh, you know, this isn't, I don't think this is working. I don't want to change it. I think your intention was this. Can we word it like this so, to where it works? And hmm. to me, it's, it's to clean things up to bring clarity and simplicity and ease. Uh, I learned that lesson very, very early on uh, from Mike Selinker. And I think he's one of the best in the biz at it. And he told at me. De- at developing? Absolutely. Because he told me when he worked on Access and Allies, 
the first thing he did was he walked in and said, you know, why do we have these weird odd numbers for costs that make people think about higher math? Why don't we switch them to even? So it's just, and, and make the chip denominations like, like a two and a four, if everything's two and four based, hmm. right? So you don't have to think. So it's just like, I'll take one of those, one of those, one of those, because I have three chips. And for me, that was the explosion of, oh my gosh, I get it, right? I, I get what you're saying. You, you, don't, you don't have to make it so complex. If somebody wants something to happen as a mechanic and it takes three steps, but everybody always does those three steps, why not just give them that item? Right, so his idea was if, if you start a game and on the first turn everybody builds, then why not give everyone three items, you know, or three characters or three things that they build? Because if everybody does it, why waste a whole entire turn where everybody builds? Just give it to them as part of the setup. Right. And that... Well, he me, did a phenomenal I mean, job oh. uh, editing that game. Now oh that you mentioned it, Axis and Allies, for a while I was crediting him with the design because it was such oh. a good Yeah, all, fix. The, all the revised stuff, and then all of them that came out afterward, all, all just benefited from that streamlined, just beautifully well done. And he didn't change anything. He didn't change Larry Harris's original design. He just complemented it by just tightening some things up. And I think that is the most important thing. That's what I see Kevin Wilson do in designs. He just, you know, when he was at flight, everything he did at Fancy Play, I felt like he just took and turned those knobs just a little bit more to the, to the right and made so many better you know, I 100% games. agree with that, if only for um, Cosmic Encounter oh and Arkham Horror. Descent. Oh, my gosh. So it's games that he took, and then he developed them further. And I always said he's one of the best developers in business. But it's interesting because developing is a skill – that a lot of designers don't have, right? They, they know how to design a game, and a lot of designers often want to skip that process, and you can tell in, in finished games. Yeah, well, and playtesting, too. A lot of development is playtesting. It's playing your games with little cardboard, like little paper counters and like colored crayons and Sharpies, right? And, and not being afraid to write on your cards and, and writing and playing a game and going, oh, that stunk, and, and switching it and doing all that. And I mean, I, I go through multiple iterations. My favorite games to develop are, are when somebody like Mighty Box, though, walks up and gives me a game, and I play it three times in a row, and all I have is, I'd like to level up a little more. Can we lower the experience points needed to level up? And they go, yeah, well, we would just get stronger. All we'd have to do is maybe strengthen the encounter decks a little bit. And I'm like, we should do that. And they're like, do you think people like to level up a little quicker? And I'm like, I, I, I would. I would like to... You know, start out at level one, get to level two, get to level three, right? I want to crank through my levels. You know, I want to feel accomplished in my game. But that's just me. Will we be seeing more Spurs? Absolutely. Uh, Spurs just got a reprint, so it's back in stores again. Uh, my retail shops have been phenomenal in, in supporting it. The new expansion's out. People keep playing it. Uh, folks like yourself keep talking about it, which I, I greatly appreciate. And it just keeps like a life of its own it just keeps going and going and uh you know as long as there's a demand for it i know Oli wants to keep creating in the universe and, and we'll keep keep playing in the sandbox is it uh coming to uk someone wants to know yeah it is actually we uh just sent a bunch of copies to is dvm distribution in the united kingdom so uh it's my understanding they sell to the majority of the retail game shops all over the uk so uh yeah they just recently like within a few days i'm glad you said that because we have a few minutes left here oh cool um what's it like i mean how do you, as a designer, and this is a good, for a lot of people do Kickstarter, they make the game, they kickstart it, and send it to the backers, right? But yep. you still want to produce the game afterwards. Absolutely. I think. Some people I can't tell with. <laughs> All right? So then, what do you do next? What would you be your recommendation? How do they get the game into the local stores? You know, uh, I think the resources that are out there, Gamma, mm -hmm. right? Origins, Gen Con, the trade show circuits, right? Uh, you, you go out, you get a booth, you spread the word to the people. Uh, all the distributors are always there. And uh, they approach you. That's just kind of the way it is. They have so many products that, you know, they, they walk around. They send their sales force out. They look at all the booths. They look at your presentation. And if they think the game looks good and they think it could be would be a good addition to them, then they come up to you and they, you know, offer you a card and say, we'd like to carry your product. And, and it's hap it, happened to, it happens to everyone. I mean, and Toy Fair was a, a, to a lesser degree. Uh, Toy Fair is pretty pricey. I, I found to go pretty early. But, uh, you know, some of these shows, you know, John Ward at, at uh, Gamma makes these things very affordable for folks to come in for a day or two, I think, anyway. We yeah, don't no, have I, to drop major marketing. I definitely agree there. You know what I mean? And, and, and for a brand new company, that's where you're going to get hamstrung. If you go dropping thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to try to market yourself and get out there, you're going to be thirty or $40,000 in the hole. Uh, you know, and those guys, I think you could get a booth in, in a hotel room in Vegas for under a grand, you know, and that's that's awesome. All right, well, we have our next designer is here, so. Oh, and this guy excites me because 
He, if, if this is who I think he is, this was one of my very first board games and is still on my top 10 of all time, Fortress America. Yep. yep. So, and it is who you think it is. So uh, awesome. So This is really exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. So that Thank was, you, Sean, for coming on the show. Thank you. Was that what they call a tease in the business? Right? <laughs> no, that was just a spoiler. Okay. That's what that's called. <laughs> well, I didn't say who he was. Well, okay. Anyhow, um, <laughs> give me a couple seconds, folks. We're going to put this on mute. We'll be right back. I think I have this pronunciation right. This is Vlada Kavatio. Close? Yeah. Okay. Who is Sean Brown, who just went off. Uh, Mike Gray's coming on after him. He wanted me to make clear that Vlada is also in his top ten game designers. And I think many people think you're one of the best designers of all time. Because you've designed such great games. And, I, of course, I know you won't say that. But um, uh, you started designing games when? Actually... Uh, I don't remember when I started designing games because I was like always creating games as a child f uh, for myself. Yeah, then I was uh, working with uh, children with like uh, free time activities, yeah, and summer camps and so on. And uh, I was always creating games in some way, yeah. And uh, then I was doing uh, video games for some time and. At the same time, I was doing, you know, uh, it was after a revolution uh, in uh, our country. There was, uh, the, uh, there was uh, the country was open now to uh, Western influence, and right. we, uh, I, me and my friends, uh, we founded a board game club and uh, played this big uh, U.S. games like uh, uh, Advanced Civilization and History of the World and so on. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it was, you know, it was very inspiring. Blood Royal it was <laughs> uh, like awesome experience all weekend, <laughs> and it was very inspiring. And uh, so I then created this big games for my friends, uh, and you know later uh, we uh, the, uh, we also uh, learned there are these Euro games. Uh, that uh, you know, we were surprised that uh, the game game doesn't need to be very big and long uh, to uh, to to give a very good experience. But yeah, sometimes I was missing the elements from the, <laughs> these big games, so that's why my uh, games are rather heavy, even if they use mostly Euro mechanics. But yeah, that's. That's how I got to board game creating. Uh, I was doing them uh, when I was uh, in the video game industry. I was at the same time developing uh, board games. And then at one, one moment I just told myself that I enjoy it more. And uh, I quit my video game uh, job and start uh, to work. Uh, we founded uh, Czech Games Editions and I uh, work uh, for the for this uh, publishing company and uh, I'm developing games. Yeah. What was your first game? My first game? My first published game? Yes, sir. It's 
probably Arena, Arena Morituri the Salutant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this was, this was my first published game. Okay, and I think the first game that really got people talking was probably uh, Through the Ages. Yeah, yeah. And that game, you mentioned that you played Advanced Civilization. Um, yeah. Or the Civilization board game. Yeah, yeah. What made you design your own Civilization game, and what was uh, like inspiration for it? Actually, it was not the Advanced Civilization. It's quite different. No. But uh, indirectly, because as, as long as I know that uh, Sid Meier uh, uh, says that uh, Advanced Civilization inspired him to uh, create uh, Civilization the board game, uh, mm -hmm. the computer game, yeah, right. video game. And uh, that was my inspiration, yeah. Because well, I you can tell because it feels a lot like the computer game in many ways. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's the it's, it's the great theme. Yeah, it told me this is a great theme. Yeah, and uh, I experimented. But actually, uh, the rage is is my second uh, take on this on this theme. I had one a civilization game before that. Mm -hmm. I played with my my friends. It was. Uh, I really liked it, yeah. And uh, but I was some uh, I was uh, not very happy with some elements of the game. And when trying to uh, do them better, I read it the game. Uh, and now it's through the ages, yeah. Well, now through the ages has had several editions. Um, is there another edition coming out? Is there any changes coming out in the future? Uh, uh, for the new edition of Through yeah, the Ages. Yeah, uh, there will be a new edition to Rages probably this year, I mm -hmm. hope. Yeah, and uh, actually, you know, uh, the game works. Uh, people like it, yeah. Uh, I can, uh, I can s uh, see. But uh, there are some things that I think are not uh, not, uh, not, very, not, not, not well done. I would do them better this, uh, this day. And... Uh, I think that uh, players are not playing the game because of this thing, but despite of these things, yeah. So uh, I think when we are now doing a new edition with new art and uh, rebalancing stuff and so on, uh, so uh, these small changes will help the game to be better. And so far we have very, very good response for because what we do is we let players that play the game all the years <laughs> Uh, and <coughs> uh, uh, so we want to hear their opinion on the changes, and they like it so far. So, well, that's exciting to hear about. Now, one of the things in your games, especially through the ages and Space Alert and things like that, the rules are written differently than any other rule book. Usually, they're written very funny. Um, uh, with a, is, how do you go about writing the rule books? Actually, it. Uh, Today, this is uh, my first big rule book, mm -hmm. and uh, I am sure we will do it better this way because uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I told you I, I, I have uh, video game roots, so I think that good tutorial is important for the game. Yeah. Right. So uh, we are writing uh, the rules, uh, rule books, the way that it teach players how to play, but since. Uh, uh, we had uh, some mixed reaction to uh, Galaxy Tracker rulebook and uh, to the Aegis rulebook. It is good for teaching the game, but then when players know the game and just want to find something in the rulebook, uh, they uh, it is harder, yeah, because it is not logically organized. It is organized in the way how you learn the game. Right. And. Uh, that's why we started. Since Space Alert, there is uh, uh, like a guidebook that uh, uh, learn uh, teach you how to play the game, and it's funny. And uh, we try to be entertaining, and with lots of examples and so on. And then there is rulebook, much shorter, with exact uh, specification of rules. So when you want some reference, you take a look to a rulebook. When you teach the game uh, to someone else, you can follow the this guidebook and. Uh, there is, I think, also some summary of a uh, guidebook uh, in the end. Yeah, and we so definitely saw this in uh, Mage Wars, where there was Mage one... Mage Knight, yeah. I'm sorry, Mage Knight. Yeah, Mage Knight, yeah. where there was one rule book that walks you through the game, yeah. but when you're done, there's another rule book with references and everything. Exactly. In fact, yeah. Fantasy Flight, I think, 
stole your idea because that's what they do with all their games now. Oh, I think it's not stolen idea. Yeah, I know, I, I'm I know. Gl- I'm glad if uh, because I think this has to, it has to be done this way. It is best uh, to be done this way, and I'm happy if I inspired uh, uh, some uh, someone to do it too. Yeah, because that's, that that makes sense. And now we are doing it with uh, all games, and the new edition of the ages will be done the same way. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, one of our listeners said, when you design a game. Um, do you start with the theme first, or do you like have mechanisms in mind and then go there? Uh, you know, uh, I am, my design process is, the game is a very long time usually, in some, uh, some uh, st- uh, unsure state in my mind, and I am not, uh, it can, uh, I am just thinking, ah, this would be awesome to do something like this, and so on, and... Uh, but I keep it in my mind and uh, keep thinking about it, combining it with uh, various uh, various mechanics and so on. And it can anything can change. Yeah? Anything, two things can combine together and so on uh, during this period. But uh, since uh, uh, at the moment when I really I was like, okay, I have enough ideas for this game, and I start to work on it. Uh, from this moment, uh, the team never changes. The team is only fixed thing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, it's. If you use a team, uh, it guides you. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you can see there are any amount of uh, yeah, unlimited, uh, unlimited amount of games you c- that can be created, and you need to make lots of decisions. Yeah, which mechanics to use, how to use it, how to combine it, and so on. And if I have a team uh, fixed, uh, then I can always I al- I'm always trying to follow the. Uh, the way that that fits the team best, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, team is. Uh, I, I I would not say the team is first when creating the game. I can have I can have uh, I uh, can have some idea for mechanics, mm-hmm. and then I am trying to find a team for it. But I am not working on a game before I have a team fixed. All right. Um, now you said you created a lot of heavy games, and you certainly have games that are rich and full of lots of mechanisms, but you've also created uh, Bunny Bunny Moose Moose yeah. and mm-hmm. other party games. We just saw Pictomania come out. So is it difficult to switch to that kind of design? It's a different kind of design, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's not difficult to switch because, you know, uh, I am doing games because I enjoy doing them and playing them. Yeah, And I... M- uh, I enjoy playing uh, lighter games, yeah, just having fun with friends. And you know, when when I am playing them, I am thinking about them, and just sometimes it is much easier to create lighter game, but it is not so easy to create successful lighter game, yeah. Right. Uh, right. So personally, I think I am better at the heavier games. But if I have an idea that was not done yet, and uh, you know. I usually what inspires me is if I something if I see something is missing on the on the market. I loved uh, drawing games, but uh, I loved the part where I am drawing and uh, many games. Just I we were taking turns and I had to wait and it's my turn to, to draw something. And <laughs> but I I like also guessing, so I made a game where you are drawing and guessing at the same time. It's like uh, a bit chaos, but uh, yeah, uh, I had fun playing it and I had fun developing it. Now, uh, someone asked, um, when you uh, begin making a game, what yeah. do you? How do you do, you? do you like make the game, or is it mostly in your mind? Or are you writing it down? Yeah. So uh, first, it is in my, in my mind. I just um, thinking about uh, stuff and so on. And when uh, there is more of them, I don't want to uh, forget them. So I create a directory and Excel file, basically. And I w- I'm writing my ideas to this Excel file because Excel is like some intelligent piece of paper. Yeah, you can organize it then and uh, later when I, you know, m- most of my uh, games have some cards in it and so on. So uh, and many elements. So then I can organize it better the idea, and then I can uh, make an export that exports some data from this. That can be uh, used to make a card. I never, I never like, except for lighter games like Bunny Bunny Moose Moose. <laughs> I usually don't do that. Uh, some typesetting, yeah, for the cards. I 
I am doing this automatically. I have Excel file. I will export it and then I use because I'm programmer by my general profession. So I or education, uh, I will uh, create a program that types at the card for mm-hmm. the cards for me. And actually now for the fairly long time, I also I, I will not even print them. I will create virtual virtual prototype on my screen and first uh, many games of the uh, many sessions of the game I just play against myself uh, uh, on the computer screen yeah sometimes I am using just some drag and drop and drag and drop uh, interface sometimes uh, I even program some support so it is it playing more automatically and when I see the when I am happy with the game because that, that's the only criteria I think in my games that I have to li- like it yeah to follow right. the idea uh so when uh i'm happy with the game and i enjoy playing it uh then i print the first prototype and bring it to people uh, at this moment it usually has some uh basic art and everything because you know i want when i was playing with it it was just joy for me to <laughs> to right. int- to do it right and uh, also yeah you know uh in our game club there's yeah hundreds games published nice looking yeah and i am very uh I uh, great uh, great for for the people uh, for the uh, my friends are playing my game even they, if they they know that it is not finished yeah, and so on so I want the game when I present to the people I want it to work as good as possible yeah I'm not just testing if it will work with people mm-hmm. uh, I I'm testing it with myself and it, then I just want to see wh- what's their opinion yeah uh, on what I already like it. Yeah. Right. Um, now, someone asked, uh, do you play your own, after you've designed them and done them, do you play your own games still for fun? Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's, it needs usually some time uh, after publishing, yeah, because uh, before publishing a game, I play it a lot and I explain it a lot and uh, I... Uh, I am, you know, watching people play and so on. And when it is out, yeah, I am happy. Whew, I can do anything, uh, something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, I spent so much time with the game uh, uh, that, uh, and during the time, there are new ideas, yeah, flowing in my mind. And ah. I need to postpone them, yeah. And uh, that means that uh, when a, g- a game is finished in printer, which is usually just very short time before SN, uh, then I I really, you know, I, I'm relieved and I say, okay, now I can follow my other ideas and so on and, uh, you know, take care of my personal life. And so. yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, so uh, that's, uh, but there are some games that you, you can say uh, w- which game I enjoy playing most uh, according to how many expansions they they have because when i <laughs> enjoy you know i when i enjoy playing a, a game then uh doing an expansion is a good thing because i can work and <laughs> enjoy the enjoy the game so uh yeah there is my friends knew that uh i never say no uh to play galaxy tracker <laughs> I, i never say no either <laughs> yeah and uh, they were misusing it yeah we were on a, one, an event not sleeping that was last night for four AM <laughs> I need to go sleep. What about Galaxy Tracker? Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What can I do? <laughs> But yeah. Uh so uh uh yeah I I I, I as I've said I I like I uh, I never want to publish a game I would not like, yeah. Right. So that's Well well let's talk about that. You said when you started designing You um, also were involved in starting CGE, uh, the, the the check. I'm sorry, the, the checkboard games. Uh, check uh, games editions. Check games editions. Yeah. What was the, what what's your role in the company now? I know you're a designer, but what else are you doing there? Yeah, so uh, you know the, uh, I would say there's some. Uh, the role can be like a developer or editor. Yeah. So, like, did you work on Alchemists at all? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I was working on the game too. Uh, since you know, 
actually the author of uh, Alchemist. Uh, he is a programmer that works for our digital uh, department. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's very good. He's he did this uh, uh, fly uh, flight this uh, flight phase of uh, Galaxy Tracker and. Uh, yeah, and uh, he approached me and showed me the game, and I saw uh, saw this is very it has very good potential, uh, and we were discussing it and so on. Then we introduced to CGE, uh, and yeah, I was working on this game too. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, one of my roles in the company, uh, but uh, I am not as much involved with other games. Uh, then because the the point is that. I am doing this in my company for my games mostly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if I uh, submit a game to another company, they would have some people that work on it, yeah. They develop the game and uh, uh, do the art and write the rule books and so on. But uh, for uh, uh, in our company, I can do this for my game myself. Of course, with in cooperation with other people in the company. Uh, but I am uh, uh, with uh, I am uh, involved uh, to the very end. Yeah. So uh, and that's good. That's <laughs> yeah. On one side, it's like a uh, very exhausting thing, as I said. Right. Yeah. If I would pitch a game to uh, another publisher, then I can say, okay, it works. It's prototype. Do a game from it. Yeah. But uh, here I am really attending every detail. So it's a uh, uh, but. Uh, I am then much happier with the result, yeah, because I can influence it to the very end. Now, Alchemist um, utilizes the the, iPhone, the the phone, the tablet, etc. It brought in a digital aspect to the game. Sorry, uh, when you're yeah. using the phone yeah, yeah, to take yeah. pictures of the cards and using electronics in a board game, what do you think about that as a designer? To bring in uh, actually uh, there is no reason to avoid it uh, I think yeah uh, because it is part of the game mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry I want to say this part of the real world now yeah and uh, you know uh, uh, as a designer I see the uh, lots of opportunities of what it offers actually uh, if I would doing space alert now instead of uh, six seven years ago, uh, I would use the app, yeah, because uh, we put CD there uh, with uh, some tracks, mm -hmm. yeah, it would be much easier. But but at that moment we were afraid the sm small devices are not as spread, yeah. So we uh, went this way, yeah. So I am definitely as a designer I see the opportunities. And uh, it can, and I know there are traditionalists that say, yeah, I don't want uh, anything electronic in my game and so on. But uh, I am definitely not afraid of this. And I, as I said, uh, as long as it is uh, really used to uh, make something new and interesting in the game, and I think uh, alchemists are doing some, are in this category, then uh, I'm perfectly okay with it. Now, with your games, you've made games that have made you very popular. Um, they, someone said here that there was a convention where uh, the Vladicon, where they only play your games. Um, there's, uh, uh, your games are very high on Board Game Geek in the top ranked games. Um, but some of your games are very divisive. Like take for example, Galaxy Trucker. Yeah. Some people love it, like myself. Other people, they hate it. What do you think about the fact that your games sometimes are so, uh, people actually, love them or hate them? Actually, I think that it's best thing, yeah. I, I am uh, perfectly okay with it. You know, the point is, uh, you can g create a game that is, say, seven or eight for everyone, yeah. Mm -hmm. and this is a very successful game, marketing-wise, yeah, definitely, yeah. And uh, uh, but this is not what the uh, uh, the ga board gaming world needs, yeah. They're because you know, if I create a game that is seven, eight, or and eight for everyone. I don't contribute too much because there is so many, uh, each player can find so many sevens and eights. So if I create a game that is uh, uh, ten for or nine for half people and uh, one or two for another people, that's perfect, yeah? Because I don't force anyone to buy and play my game. 
Yeah, and these people, even if there is 100 people that consider it uh, 10, and 1,000 people that consider it is one, that's that's perfectly okay because I give to 100 people, they are 10, and uh, and there is uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, fifty uh, thousand or something like that. Uh, other games to play for the others yeah so actually I am not a not a big fan of ratings <laughs> yeah because uh, that's for me it's important to how many players uh, the game really appeals right. I don't care to how many players it, it doesn't appeal yeah because mm -hmm. you know it makes no sense except for some uh, letters and so on it makes no sense uh, It uh, the game, uh, uh, yeah. The, uh, the uh, I think that uh, the more specialized, uh, especially now when there's so much game, specialized game that uh, really appeals to uh, some small, uh, smaller group of people, is are good. Yeah. No, I I agree with you there. I think that's important. Uh, what so I mean, it's really neat when you probably get emails from people who say you have made their favorite game. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah, no, it of course pleases me because that's why I'm doing it. Yeah. So speaking of what you're doing, what can you tell us about the future? What what can we see this year, maybe from you? Uh, this year, I concentrate mostly on the Trudo Age, Trudo Ages project. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's a big game, and uh, you know, uh, I, I I was not touching it uh, for <laughs> last eight nine years uh, because uh, when I was doing it, it was I was really involved. And I was thinking all the time about how to do the game and so on. And uh, it is not a game I can just return in one week and do some changes or expansions or something like this. Yeah. Uh, so now I returned there because we all are also doing a digital implementation of the game. Yeah. Okay. And it is actually it was kind of a reason of how to time these things because we said okay we need better art for the app, uh, why to not and maybe better balance, uh, why to not do this also for the board game, yeah, and uh, so that's it. This is this is mine, uh, my biggest uh, project uh, for this year. Then uh, we are doing one uh, thing that I really uh, love and it's a small expansion to Galaxy Tracker. Because uh, you know, that's, I admit that I was kind of inspired by video games. Yeah, with this real-time uh, part of the game. Right. Then, so I created this board game. Then I, it, it inspired the app, our digital implementation of Galaxy Tracker, and uh, we added some stuff, some quests, uh, and interesting stuff here yeah, to to the campaign. So you can, uh, uh, you have fresh experience with each flight. And now I. Uh, I'm going back to board game, and we have expansion that implement these quests. Yeah. So is this expansion called the biggest expansion? No, actually it is relatively small. But what good on it? It can be played with the base game only. Okay. Uh, also with expansion, but it is. Uh, I have seen players that played all the expansions and so on. I play test with them basic game plus quests. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had good fun, yeah. Because you are uh, you are facing uh, different ch challenges every, uh, each flight. You just pick a quest. For, for example, you you have to, there are the special tiles from digital version, like heavy cargo or exploding cargo, and so on. And there are special rules uh, or competition of who will deliver most uh, most explosive cargo without getting his ship blown, and, and so on. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's. Uh, It's very nice a way how to return to, uh, to the base basic game because it works and and you also have a party yeah. game that you're working on yeah yeah uh, I it's uh, getting like really good yeah. buzz here yeah I am really happy uh, how how uh, players here on gathering are ac accepting it yeah because I, I whenever I see them playing and enjoying it it's it's great it was not it is a simple idea. But uh, it works very well, and uh, we will definitely publish it. Too. What's the name of it? Uh, I call it. Uh, we call it so, uh, Code Names for so far. It, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's working title, but probably will stay or just slightly altered. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, so this is another thing. Uh, this will probably came this year. 
Well, I know everybody will be very sad, but at this point we have to, to finish this this up here. But there's so much we could talk to you about. Maybe we'll we'll talk in the future. But I want to say thank you. You've made you've been such a, a contribution, and also even for your country, to see your country just become so big in the board games at this point in time. And that's much because of what you've done. And we appreciate that. Thanks so thank much you. for coming on the show. Yeah, okay. All right, in fact, folks, thanks for asking questions. We're not done yet. I'm going to put you on mute, and I'll be back in a moment. Folks, now, Mike Gray may not be the most recognizable name, but that's shame on you for not knowing that because he is, uh, as you might have heard yesterday um, from, from Mike Fitzgerald, talked quite highly of you and, and Tom Lehman, and you have influenced many people. But let's talk about that a little bit. What, just tell folks some of the games that you've designed that they may have heard of. Well, um... Probably Fortress America and Shogun, the original Game Master Shogun, are the ones that I did back in the 80s. Um, before that, I did probably three dozen games from 78 to 81. They were mostly Milton Bradley kids' games, licensed games. Um, not all licensed games, but... Um, so I, I did those. Um, Mall Madness, Dream Phone, o o o o <laughs> Omega Virus. Ooh! I didn't realize you were involved with in Omega Virus. Oh yeah, that was. That I, was, that I really was hate my, that. That was my idea. I hate that. Uh, not the game, but the. Yeah. Well, that the guy talking to me. Well, that's that's an interesting story actually. Um, when I did Mall Madness, uh, the head of Hasbro, in a line review, said, "That looks like a uh, the mall looks like a mausoleum because it was just a gray prototype, and the voice is tinny and annoying." So I thought, well, if that's the best we can do for a mall game. I'll design a game that's tinny and annoying. So I, you just take what you can get, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. we, just, and we just had 100 words back then, 100 words to do a whole verbal game. Because, you know, verbal electronic games were like, you know, there weren't that many of them, and they were real expensive. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I just had this idea of doing a game where the voice was tinny and annoying, and I thought, how, you know, what can we do here? And, I, and my, t my thoughts at that time were that, an electronic game should have something in it that made it necessary for it to be electronic. Right. In other words, and, and there were quite a few games that were electronic that you could have played with cards on a board. They were just like two or three times as expensive, but they had electronics in them. But you didn't need the electronics. So, um, so I put together a game where the object was to destroy the space station. The, the AI had taken over a space station orbiting Earth. You, you, you know the game. And um, the idea is that the players are, are like uh, agents going in to try to destroy this thing before it wipes out the planet. So we had 100 words to run the game. And so it left me, I probably had six or seven words where the, where the uh, computer could actually say things to sort of insult the players. And, and, <laughs> and, and then what we did was we, because it was supposed to be this crazy thing that, that killed all the humans and it was going to start wiping out cities, we, we made it go crazy over time. So what happened is, as you play the game, and it's only a half an hour, in 30 minutes I'm taking over, he says. So um, we, we had the, the modulation on the voice go up and down as you played it. So the computer appeared to be going mad. But yet, it was just the same words. So 
it's, I don't know, it was pretty cool. I'm kind of proud of it. Yeah, and there's, I mean, it's one of those games that people still talk about yeah. today in, in, yeah. in tones of hushed horror. Um, now, you mentioned some of the other games. One of the games that I distinctly remember, and the name is escaping me, with the big plastic mat and the, the two forces of fantasy fighting each other um, with the giant troll. Oh, and the Battle cat. Masters. Battle Masters. Man, that's a neat... I mean... I can't even imagine something like that being in the store today just because of the massive amount of plastic that's in it. Yeah, that was a Steve Baker uh, game, Battle Masters. Steve Baker did, um, uh, let's see, he did Hero Quest. Okay, and, and then, were and you then, involved with those games at all at that it, point? Well, involved is uh, when I first started and went over to Europe, I went to Hasbro, or it was actually Milton Bradley, over in, um, uh, in England. And I met this guy, Steve Baker, who was a game designer over there. And we became really good friends. And he had this new project to do Hero, uh, Hero Quest, mm -hmm. which, was, which was basically a license that Hasbro had taken from Games Workshop. Right. Not Hasbro. It's Milton Bradley, sorry. Now uh, Hasbro, back but then, yes. Now Hasbro. And uh, so Steve came over to my house and stayed for a couple weeks. And he and I worked, uh, we played with the Games Workshop ideas, which we didn't like at all. And, uh, and we worked on it in my basement for a couple of weeks, and he went back to England, and then he designed the game, Hero Quest. And then um, later we worked, uh, I mean, I play-tested with him um, the big Battle Masters game, which was amazing. Um, and Steve Baker is, is a great designer. Uh, he, he, works, he still works for Hasbro. Um, that's another interesting story. But... Uh, but uh, I'm I'm a pr I'm a pretty good gamer, and when I but when I played Battle Masters with Steve, it was just amazing. And it, he like beat me ten games out of ten, and 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 we played both sides, so he obviously knew the tactics, you know. And you think, oh, it's just a battle game, but how you deploy your cavalry and knowing the deck and what's coming out and all that, he, he was great. So um, and we had a lot of fun with Battle well, Masters. Well, speaking of that, and uh, when we talked to Rob Davio a couple of days ago, and he mentioned you. What do you think about that, that you've worked with so many of these guys who have gone off to become some pretty big designers? Well, it's just part of my career. I, I have had a great career. I'm retired now, a little more than a year. Um, you know, one of my greatest accomplishments is, I mean, I hired Tracy Hickman, who went on to be one of the guys who, you know, co-wrote the Dragonlance series. Great series. I, I loved his dungeons, and we hired him when I worked at TSR for a few years, because um, I left... Milton Bradley and went to TSR. Gary Gygax hired me, and I worked there for a while. And uh, so I'm really, you know, proud of Tracy, what he's become. And um, and then, you know, working at Hasbro, some of the people that, I mean, Steve Baker, uh, who worked at Milton Bradley and then went off to on his own, and then he worked at Bluebird, and then it was Mattel or us, and I got him to come work with us and come to the U.S., and so that was a big accomplishment. Steve's wonderful. Hiring Craig Van Ness, uh, that was great. Hiring Rob Davio, um, you know, he's a big player now. He's great. He just lives a few miles away, and, and I can go to his house and play test stuff. And So he's a good friend. I mean, just a lot of the people. Larry Harris, who did Axis and Allies, after I left and went to TSR, they hired a few people, and Larry Harris was one of them. So, um, you know, I got to work on and develop Axis and Allies second edition. Uh, after Larry left, so um, yeah, it's been a great, r great ride, and knowing all these people is, are really cool. And um, you know, one thing I would say as advice to everyone is, uh, you know, when you meet people, if you have some knowledge of what they do, and you know, compliment them, they think, wow, you know, this guy knows something about my work, and everybody likes to hear good things about their work, and uh, that always, you know, just being good to people pays off. Well, so. speaking of complimenting, I cannot not talk about Fortress America because, I mean, for me as a, as a teenager, that was a seminal moment when I first set that up and saved the America from the Russians. <laughs> How good you won. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, I played it a lot. I mean, I didn't always okay. win, but it felt good. I mean, I always liked being America because very patriotic. What was, like, the inspiration for that game, uh, especially in the, the height of the Cold War at that point? Well, um, there was like an Invasion of America movie. And it was, well, I think it was Chuck Norris and Red Dawn and stuff like that had come out. And uh, 
So, you know, we thought that would be kind of an interesting theme. I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, imagining our country being invaded by the rest of the world. Right. Um, and, you know, and you had to suspend some things, like Canada is our ally. You know, they're up in the north, and we don't have to worry about them. Thank you, Canada. So, and, and it's great to have the whole top of the board safe from invasion. You yeah. know? <laughs> and I also wanted to do something that was uh, asymmetrical. I like the idea of three-on-one a lot. You know, we had come out of the era of uh, um, Axis and Allies, wh which was, you know, three against two, um, you know, Conquest of the Empire, uh, Broadsides and Boarding Parties. Those were the games that Larry Harris brought to Milton Bradley. And, um, and so Fortress America was one where I just, I, I always try to do something different if I can, you know, just put something fresh in there. So, you know, three against one is cool. You can play two players. One player does three against one. But you can also play with, you know, more than, more than two players. Um, the thing in Fortress America that I'm really proud of uh, is the, uh, the dice system. Um, and it, and it, it dawned on me when I was designing it that uh, r we have red, white, and blue dice. Yes. And it's Fortress America. And the red dice are for, like, the red-blooded soldiers. The white dice is for sort of the, uh, the, the armor, the, the shiny steel armor. And blue is for the for the air units. Sky. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. And it was kind of cool because when uh, Chris Peterson told me that they had got the rights to do a new Fortress America, and, uh, uh, you know, that was really cool. And, um, and then they had Kevin doing it. That was really cool. Um, I, I said, you know, the thing I'm most proud of, I told him this story. And he goes, oh, I don't think we're going to do that, but I'll make sure we do it. So in the new game there red, white, and blue dice. So, I don't know. It's just kind of a little hidden <laughs> thing that I like. Well, I mean, how did you get these games made in the first place? I mean, these are games with, I mean, the, the Game Master series. There's thousands, well, I mean, in each game, there's hundreds of plastic pieces. That's not something that Milton Bradley had done much before, was it? Mm, well, we had done, I mean, we have the capability of molding sprues with yeah, but how did you convince them it. to do this? This isn't the type of game they normally oh, were putting okay. in the store. So, so that I have to give credit to Larry Harris. After I left, um, you know, they had they hired Ned Horn from Eon, who did Cosmic Encounter. Okay. Uh, they hired Bruce Whitehill, who's the big game hunter. Um, he's a game designer, game collector, and, and, and a writer, good guy. And then they, after that, uh, I was TSR went through a real strange period. Uh, they hired a whole lot of people, and then they fired a whole lot of people. And I finally decided to, to leave um, when I came back. And that's a whole story in itself, but I don't know how much time yeah, we so have. so many stories. We'll never um, get to all of them. When, when, I, uh, when I came back, um, um, Larry was, was there for a while, and then he left. And, and I worked on, um, you know, the Axis and Allies um, redos. There was a whole pile of paper. Um, of letters and, and I looked through them and tried to you know develop the game a little bit so things worked a lot, out a lot better when I came back. I can't. I've lost my train of thought. What was your original question? <laughs> How you convinced Milton Bradley? To oh yeah, yeah, yeah. These so, giant so, games. so Larry Harris was there, and what happened was when they hired Larry. I, that's great. Thanks. When they hired Larry, um, he had Axis and Allies with Nova Games. Uh, Cit C Citadels, uh, so, what was it, Six Caesars or something, that's what it was called, with Citadel, and he had broadsides and boarding parties. So he had these games. So Larry came in as a kind of a replacement for me and Ned, and, and, uh, and uh, he had these games, and they were looking for some more revenue, and it was a new area, and Larry basically talked him into making deals and taking these games out of the hobby adding plastic and putting them into the mass market and simplifying them a bit. So, so you know, Larry talked him into doing that. And, um, and it, they did pretty well, I mean, at a low level, but it was like a new, fresh category. And it was a, you know, it was a good area. Axis and Allies is still around today. Um, so uh, we, did the, 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 we did the Game Master uh, series, which was like five games, and then later... You know, Avalon Hill, we had that opportunity in 1998, and we did 10 games then, and I was in charge of that whole effort. Wow, you've been just involved in so much. Now, 
you just said you retired, but you've been involved in the gaming industry a while. What are some things that you've noticed for good or for bad that have changed in the gaming industry since you've started? Oh, I have to be a little careful there because I still on I'm still on severance with Hasbro. <laughs> okay, well, you know, um, but okay. I would say maybe right, just the good thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, I think that the I mean it's nice that there are some of the hobby games in Target and Walmart and Toys R Us. I mean, I like the fact. I mean, so there's a real break, you know. There's the under twenty dollar games and there's the over forty dollar games. A few of them. I'm glad they're in there. You know, they say board games are back, but I knew board games would be back. People have gone into, you know, electronics, and the electronics make us all singular, but people are starting to discover it's actually fun to be with other people again, which yes. I think is wonderful, just wonderful, because we're social creatures. Um, as far as the game business, uh, I mean, I really like what I see at Barnes & Noble, and I hope they survive, because that's where there's a great variety of great games. Um, I think the, the hobby stores are around, the game stores, but they suffer because people can buy products cheaper online, and that's, that's kind of sad. Um, you want to support your local game store. Um, and uh, what else in the game industry? Well, you know, you've got a lot of things going on. You've got your mobile games, um, but yet they're still pretty much solo. You can play by mail. I've played over 1,000 games of Carcassonne now wow. on, on my iPad. Um, yeah, I'm a big. Car uh, That's more Carcassonne. than me. I, I think, uh, yeah, Carcassonne's a wonderful game. I play a lot of Ascension, and I highly recommend Upwards. Uh, Upwards is a terrific word game. Uh, word Word Winder is a good one too. Um, I like word games too. So, Andrew asked a else? question here that today we call a lot of these games we call them designer games because there was a movement in the past couple decades to put the designer name big and center on the box. Mm -hmm. When you were designing many games back in the days, that was not the case. Right. So that's one of the reasons not everyone knows your name. What do you right. think about that, that change? And okay. Well, uh, I got, when I was in charge, I got people's names on several games. So, I mean, not only as a, as a Milton Bradley employee, but when I went into product acquisition for 10 years, I traveled around the world, met with inventors, and some of the inventors that I met with, well-known, prolific inventors, you know, did get their names either on the box, on the box bottom, or in the rule book. Um, when I was there, I think the the idea back in the old days, we didn't put designer names. Designers didn't get credit for whatever. I think the reason, if you just can step back from that, isn't fair. Mm. is that if a company started putting someone's name on the box and they became famous, they'd have to pay them more. <laughs> so, and I think that internally I kind of understood if they put my name on the 50 or more games that I designed, um, you know, they might have to pay me more. I might go somewhere. And they kind of liked what I was doing, and I liked what I was doing too. Um, it's nice to get a paycheck every week as opposed to waiting for royalties. So um, I think that's kind of what it's more about than, than fairness, because, I mean, I think it should be on there. But then I will tell you, being on the inside at a big company, you can have a game or a game idea, but the graphics really matter. Uh, the, uh, you know, how it's marketed is really important. Um, I mean, there are things, you know, a terrific rule book. I mean, some of these games that, that I'm looking at here on, against the wall, I mean, I mean, there are games that just have killer uh, presentation. The, the rules are done in an amazing way. Like when you open a box of Jamaica, as an example, it looks like a treasure chest. You open the box, and the rules are on top, but all you see is a bed of gold bullion. I mean, that's one whole piece of the rule book. So it's right. just the present. I mean, these are the magical things that, you know, that are in games. So, I mean, it, it, all these things add. When I did... Um, Shogun, for example. The one thing that people always say they love in Shogun are the swords. That's so, right. And I needed a, um, I needed a way. Well, the, the reason for Shogun was, was Karate Kid, and stuff like that, actually. And um, and I needed to replace Conquest of the Empire, which had some issues with the catapults being overpowered and the money ran out. So it had a few issues. Um, so I wanted to replace that, and I wanted to do that Risk-type game, but I didn't like in Risk where I always got beat up by the guy in front of me. So in Shogun, you bid, I mean, you, you actually bid, but then again, if it's a tie, you draw lots. But I needed something clever. 
And it was actually Mark Hauser, a guy who was another designer, who came up with the idea of having them be swords. And I give him credit because some of the things in my games that are the real cream didn't actually come from me. They came from other people. And now, as a retired guy with some game ideas, I find that, you know, I really need, you know, a partner, a, a buddy, another designer. I need other people to play test things. I mean, it's tough to design a strategy game by yourself. People, I know people do it, but play testing is real important, and you get your really great ideas from your friends. Yes. So. So of all your designs, when you said you've had a 50 or plus, which one is the one you're most proud of? Oh, that's a hard question. I suppose Fortress America is the one I really am proud of. I love the little dice thing. I like the fact that it can come right down to the last die roll. I like that two play people could actually play the game in three hours, whereas Axis and Allies usually takes a lot longer. Um, so I found out. And, and there are other you know, neat little games I did. I did a game, I mean, my Lord of the Rings game, um, uh, that I did back, it was Ralph Bakshi's cartoons, you know, were on the cover. Ah. But, they, but uh, I did a Lord of the Rings game back in like 1980, maybe. And, and it's basically, imagine this. You're, it's a race game. You're trying to get to uh, Mount Doom and throw a ring in. Everybody's like Boromir. So you spend the whole game trying to screw all the other players so that you can get ahead. And the whole game is just kind of a screw you game. And it's, it's really fun. Um... I did a Wuzzles game, which, which, I'm, which I played with little kids a lot, and it's basically like Go Fish. So, mm -hmm. so you have this deck of cards. They're numbered one to four, uh, and they have these cartoon characters on them. And you're trying to get a set of three, and when you do, you get to move forward on a board that's 18 spaces with a couple of little rainbows that, are, that go ahead or clouds that go back, just a few. And you're try, just trying to erase, race, race through there, but you do it by playing this this you know, uh, sort of go fish game, but it adds something, which is sort of a board game go fish for little kids. And the fun thing is, you know, if, if, if there's just a little bit that kids can learn about planning, because if you get a one, but you're going to land on a space that sends you back two, you don't want to collect those. So you, I mean, but the kid may or may not get that. Or if there's some place two spaces away, you know, you may want to collect something that will let you move two so that you can go forward, because just just a little bit forward, but but, and, and you leave that, you know, it's like the kids, it's like the little thing that goes well, off in the head. how do you find this head. game now? It's just called the Wuzzles game. It's a little flat game. I, you have to, I don't know, get it on eBay or something. Yeah, I guess but it's a wonderful game down. for little kids. I played it with little kids, with my friend's kids, and, you know, with, and my, I've got a granddaughter who's three and twins that are one, so I can't wait till they get big enough so that we can have a table of four with, with, with GamePa. That's my name. GamePa. Oh, Game Pa. Yeah, they said, what do you want your grand granddaughter to call you when I had my first granddaughter? And I said, Game Pa. That's amazing. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people who steal that now. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> we're almost out of time here. Okay. But last question would be then, what would, what would be your advice to someone who's a designer now? You know, to break into this business with a kabillion games. Okay, I give the speech all the time. Um, you, you have to decide if you want to be uh, an artist or a businessman. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be an artist, you just design from your heart and you make a great game and you play it with your friends and neighbors and family and you just are proud of what you do and they all think you're brilliant and, you, and it's great. If you want to be a businessman, then you have to design a game for a whole lot of people because you want to make money. It's not about art. It's about money. And if it's about money, you're probably designing a game for people that aren't like you. You want to design for the masses. So if you have three great ideas and you want to put them all in the same game, you might just put one good idea in a game and make three games. Because first of all, you might have three great games. And also, game designers don't sell all their ideas. So if you have three kind of cool ideas, design three games and maybe somebody will buy one of them. So, and, hmm. and, and the other thing is you have to nod and listen and your first games might get rejected. And what you, I can't, emphasize this enough. If you really want to have a career in game design, which is really tough, um, you need to have people want you to come back after they remember they rejected some of your stuff. And to do that, you have to be nice. So you need to listen, and, and you need to be real friendly about no. 
it's real important. I, I told my designers when I became a manager, when they came in and I was, you know, the boss for the first time, I just said, and I hired new people, um, you have to learn, number one, to, to take rejection well. Even inside, marketing people, management, you'll say, hey, I got this great game. And you'll talk all about it and somebody will say no. And, you know, if you, and if you get all mad about it, then it's like, well, that guy's not a very nice guy or whatever. You just have to say, okay, and you can work on it at home. You can put it in a drawer because there's always going to be a time, especially on the inside, where it's like, we need a game tomorrow. What are we going to do? I remember once they wanted a, a where's the beef game for Wendy's. They wanted a card game and a board game, and they wanted to show it at 2 o'clock the next day. And they come and talk to me after lunch on the day before. So I had to come up with a where's the beef card game and board game. They had this lady, Clara Peller, who ran around and went, where's the beef? Remember that? Yes, I very much remember yeah. that. So I had to design these games in like a day. Now, they weren't that great, but I mean, and I know you're running out of time. The funny thing is my wife was a teacher, and she was telling her class that her husband designed games. And they go, well, what kind of games? And one she could remember is where's the beef? And this little kid went, Where's the beef? That's my favorite game. I play it every day. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, one of my minor efforts. But so. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, and thanks, thanks for sharing that, folks. Check out his games. You can find them all over the place. And thanks for what you've done for the hobby. I appreciate okay, well, it. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Folks, I'm going to put you on mute for a second. We'll be back with hopefully another game designer.
once again, once again, I cannot find Eric Lang. <laughs> I do not know. Uh, I talked to him last night, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry I missed the show. And we put it on his schedule. He put it on his phone. So uh, <laughs> we'll give him a few more minutes, but um, let me just quick check my email in case he emailed me or something, and maybe he's sick or something. And, you know, um, <laughs> but either way, uh, we really did get some. Let me see here. Nope, I don't see him here at all. So, anyhow, um, <laughs> um, where's the yellow hat? I'm not wearing a yellow hat today, folks. Today is the, I, I wear different hats each day, so. <sighs> okay, well, let's, uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about some of the new things I saw. Can't talk about that, can't talk about, but I can talk about um, Seven Wonders The Duel. Had a chance to play this, and folks, it was really good. There's three ways to win in it. You can win by military, you can win by science, or you can win by points. Um, and so that's just a really cool, um, just a back and forth. You like place the cards on a table in a pyramid, and you can draw a card from the pyramid. Draft, well, you're drafting from this pyramid, but when you draft, you're opening up cards for your opponent to grab. And so you're sitting there thinking about how you're going to add these cards, and it's just a, a really neat um thing to put together and I, I was just, wow i just i keep thinking about it um and how interesting that was i also played the the sequel to glory to rome and Ucronia, and the name is escaping me from asmati games um and uh i played this crazy crazy party game from repos productions and uh where we were uh, trying to uh heal a patient um and we were it was eight people playing. We were split up in teams of two, and we were running around the table and screaming, yelling. By the time we were done, I almost fell over exhausted. I felt like I played in a marathon, but it was really fun. Kind of niche. I don't think everyone's going to be all on board with that, but that was a very interesting thing to play. Um, most of the rest of yesterday, I went to Canada and saw the Niagara Falls from there, which is just mind-boggling as much as I like board games and you know stay inside and play board games to get out and see just the wonders of nature and just the amazing things like that that's just fantastic um, but I'm having a good time this is the we're now to Friday and then going into Saturday tomorrow is pretty much pretty much I mean Sunday's the last day but Sunday's kind of fizzles out Sunday's when I'm flying home um, but uh, it's been I've been getting a lot of different games played there's still some that I'm interested in trying out the 504 from Friedman Freeze and such uh, for those of you who are watching this right now seriously if you've not watched the ones from yesterday and the day before these guys have been giving such great great stories I mean it's really really impressive uh, to, 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 to listen to their stories like Mike Gray who was just on we could have talked I could have talked to him for a couple hours all those different um, stories that he has and different things it's just unbelievable so okay what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go out and hunt for Eric one last time and I'll be back and if he's not here we're gonna have to shut down I'm sorry
All right. All right. So, here's where we're at at this point in time. <laughs> um, Eric may be sleeping still, so I went and found Kevin Wilson. Now, Kevin Wilson can't be on the show because his voice is out. Um, so, uh, he was, but he texted Eric, so maybe Eric will come down. Meanwhile, but he picked up somebody more important, better, or something. How come I don't see myself? <laughs> <laughs> Am I in the frame? I can't tell. There, there we go. Um, hey, hey! That's because uh, it's, it's on a delay. Oh, All right, so okay. Steven's here. Um, this actually ruins my people being designers on the show. You're like a publisher, so. I have, I have like a little design credit. No, yes, I am, of Do course. You? In what? Yeah, like the one of the mini expansions for Survive. Uh, I think the, the giant squid, maybe, I think. <laughs> no, I'm not a designer. By any stretch of imagination, I am not a designer. I actually like the, uh, the squid, I think, over the whales, I think. So you can, you okay. can go with that. There you go. Actually, I like to use them both. Oh, it's so, cra a, crazy a chaos. Why yeah, not? Yeah. Well, I mean, chaos is good. Not always. Not always. Chaos and that game is good. That's what you want. You want that game to be crazy and fun and. Someone wants so to know what's the game with the teeth behind me? Oh, that's a uh, that's rampage, right? No, no, that's dungeon. No, that's super dungeon explore. That's super dungeon explore. So that's the go. game that was behind me. All right. So it said that Eric Lang has designed six games in the time we've all been sitting here. Um, so anyhow, I don't know about that. Here we He's are. He's kind of I, slow at designing sometimes. He takes a long time with his designs. But anyway, we've been at the gathering of friends, and you've been mostly working. And I don't agree with that. Why am I been mostly works working? In the morning. I, well, he's showing oh, off games and, I'm, and I'm, working I'm, with prototypes and things oh, like that. Eric, come here. Who are you talking about? Eric? You? Oh, me? You? Yeah, I've been working, but I've been socializing a bit with most people here who have gone to dinner with me and uh, and lunch and had maybe had a beer. Oh, you haven't done any of that with me. How come? <laughs> Because you won't schedule anything. Yeah. So here's so here we have to tell this story. What what happened yesterday? So so we had I went this, to Canada and saw Niagara Falls. That was beautiful. That's wonderful. But we had an appointment to meet at eight o'clock to play Dark Moon because I wanted nine o'clock. Was eight o'clock Dark Moon? You know my new release in June. Plug plug plug. But it's going to be a fantastic thing. I really wanted you to see because it's, oh, it's, it's actually June is. June. I didn't realize it was that quick. June is coming out. Well, tell people what is Dark Moon. Dark Moon is a real implementation uh, and retheming of BSG Express. Now, um, Evan Derrick had put up a print and play game called BSG Express, which was based on the Battlestar Galactica concept, and it had all the Battlestar Galactica stuff in there, you know. But it was print and play, no, but no money was being made. Well, it was very, very popular. It's the number one downloaded print and play game on the Geek. So he, he stripped out the BSG, rethemed it as this. More like John Carpenter's The Thing infection going through the um, the the space station. You really like that theme. I do. I mean, it's I love Hidden Trader. I mean, I love Hidden Trader. Battlestar Galactica is one of my favorite favorite games. It's one of my like ten rated games, but it's an extravaganza. It's a three four hour game when you get down and sit down and play that game, especially with you know with a full seven players. You get that experience that this you get that experience distilled into one and a half one to one and a half hours we have 60 to 75 minutes on that box and it absolutely will play like that um, and the accusations immediately start flying there was so much cursing in the game last night while we were playing it that if you were there you would have been you would you would have probably left the table because you know I, you don't like when I curse in front of you I know that very sensitive ears and all that. I would have left. I left <laughs> you would have left anyway. anyway. I came in the middle of the game. So, yeah, yeah, you, well, no, you, yes, you showed up and then left. Anyway, but they, we were supposed to play last night, but Tom shuts his phone off or something like that. So I'm like texting him, like, Tom, 8 o'clock, we're all set, we'll meet you there. No response, no response. 8.15's around. I'm like, I call him, and he's still in Canada. And I'm like, oh, chump. So. This is a lame story, really. But it's, not, it's a great story that you don't, you will not schedule things at conventions, even with your alleged friends. I think we have alleged. dinner scheduled tonight. Now, yes, finally, finally, because he feels bad, he scheduled <laughs> dinner with me for tonight. To be clear, the re one of the reasons I don't schedule things at like conventions like this is because I always feel like I'll be sitting there playing a game, like oh, oh, I can't play a game right now at two because it's supposed to be somewhere at three thirty, and then it's called you, being an adult, Tom. You schedule, you put things on a schedule, and you and you and you stay with it. This is how you know regimented publishers do these things and you know really friends do these things they do this really thing. yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all <laughs> right so people someone here says what's the twice announced news from stronghold that you still couldn't talk about last week can you talk about it now no Twi the twice announced news i think i know what they're uh 
what they're alluding at. But All no, right, well, I, let's talk about what's coming out from Stronghold I'll, this year. I'll tell we're you. I'll talk about dark. Okay, go ahead. I'll tell you when it'll be announced, though. It's going to be announced on the D6 generation. <laughs> Um, which is coming. transmission. Oh! <laughs> no, I'm not going to be on it. I'm not going to be doing the announcement. You Some... gave them a scoop? Well, they have a guest coming up who's going to be announcing it. I didn't give them the scoop, and I allowed the guest host to do that. And I can't say any more because then I'd be giving half of it away. All right, I think so let's so. talk about things we can talk about. Okay, what can we talk about? So we have Dark Moon coming out in June, so Origins. That's right. It's an Origins release. We'll definitely and have, we'll have a copy at Dice Tower Con. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Of course, of course. Okay. Um, then what's being released at Gen Con? Um, I'll have, for Gen Con, and even possibly a little before, I'll have Lagranja, or Lagranja, depending okay. on how you like to pronounce that one. Been really yeah. Hyped about that game. Very, very hyped. Uh, came out at Essen in a small print run, and now we're bringing it back. Um, I'm going to have, I have a, <laughs> my final version of Code 777. I'm actually redoing a reprint. It's been out of print now, even from my catalog, for two years. Uh, and I'm actually bringing it back because I lose the license next year. So I'm going to do another quick little, even upgraded version of that one coming out in August. Uh, Space Cadets Away Missions is obviously going to be my biggest release of the year. And that will be at Gen Con? Um, I will fly some copies in because you know you have to do that. It's, Hooray! It, I was, it was supposed to be able to arrive on the boat, but based on a few things you know that I heard this week from my well, my printer, it's not going to be able to get there. But I will fly copies in because it's obviously that important an event. And a game with over 100 plastic miniatures kind of works very well in you know, the Gen keeps, Con crowd. Keep, this is like your one thing. How about it's a great game? Well, it is a great game. It's got the Space Cadets IP. It's a cooperative game where dozens and dozens of aliens are attacking you. It's set in the golden age of sci-fi. So you've got the little green man. You've got the brain in the jar. How am I? cool as a game with a brain in a jar and guess what it actually has a little it's a two-piece thing that it has a, is a jar over a brain it's gonna it just looks amazing sorcermen leaders these things called the sentinels the big bad guys that take four hits to kill and it's it's great and you're gonna be able to this new system that was implemented by the designers it's called the overkill system that was what what they called it so when you roll for you know for success to do something if you roll more than the one success you need you can't apply extra hits, but you can then use the overkill option of the weapon or of the person or of the monster, the thing, the alien that you're going after, to do these really cool other actions on your turn. So you're gonna have this great narrative of, of events that you do on your turn. Like I, I shot the guy in my in my square, and I was able to then run into the next uh, hex to grab the neuronic hyperbolizer, it was a ridiculous name that they we created in there, uh, and to to utilize that. So. It's just going to create one of those great stories that you're going to have in the game and talk about it for times, you know, a long time after. What's the length of a game, of a scenario usually? It's uh, it's in that like you know one to two hours. We have short scenarios, we have longer ones. Plays uh, from uh, from two to s one to six players because you know co-ops you can play uh, by yourself as well. Um, very scenario based. Going to be twenty scenarios in the game itself. Um, you'll be able to create your own, very sandbox like. You'll be able to create your own scenarios as well. Um, and more and more to come there. We have, I've already commissioned uh, a, uh, a, a an expansion for that because of the, the popularity that's already been shown for it. So it's it's going to be fun. Diamonds, we've seen a reprint of that? Oh, absolutely. We're late. We're a little late on getting that, I know. But we'll have Diamonds copies in the States and in stores by the end of May at the latest early, early June. They are actually on the boat this week or next week. Speaking of um, uh, the boat and delays... Can you talk about it as a publisher? Like, mm -hmm. how did that West Coast thing affect you as a publisher? Did it affect you? It does not. Why? Why? Because I don't ship across onto the West Coast. I occasionally I will, but uh, for the most part, I come through the Panama Canal and little Panamax action to get over to the this East is, Coast. You are so blatant at your self promotion. It's disgusting. No, but <laughs> it's nice to <laughs> nice to bring that up as well. But no, but that's not the reason. Um, I, I, I. I when I heard, and the West Coast has been a problem for shipping for actually a much longer time than, than what, you know, what you've been hearing about. Now, right now, it's, it's, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. Well, getting, clearing getting, up now. getting a little bit better now, but um, so many companies got hit with this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I like, to, I like to either say, I like to think I'm a genius, but I'm not. I simply have a very good frame. I'd like to testify here. <laughs> that I'm not a genius. <laughs> um, a lot of, um, my, my freight forwarder is just very good, and they warn me. When there's when there's going to be a problem, so they warned me that things were backing up. They did this, uh, I don't know, sometime last year, middle, early last year. Things were backing up, so you can either 
you know, send it that way and cross your fingers, or you can ship it through the Panama Canal. The cost to do so is pretty small difference. It's a little cheaper to ship, a little more expensive to ship it through the Panama Canal, but if I can guarantee that my games will be in my warehouse essentially on X, minus a little bit of customs delays and stuff, versus sitting on the West Coast twiddling my thumbs with my games rotting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the extra money, and that's, that's what we did. All right. And we'll continue to do that. Someone here asked if we are still going at it in Hearthstone, but the answer is I'd like to leave my record as undefeated against Steven. Uh, mostly, I haven't played Hearthstone in a long time anyway. Yeah. That's why. No comment. Are you still playing it all the time? No, actually, I'm not. I really know. I just don't have the time to do it anymore. I use the, that, that free time I used to work, essentially. I was doing that on the train. That's when we did it that one time. And Tom <sighs> crushed me. As yeah. he said, Cry. he goes, yeah, I'm not that good at it. I'm like, oh, yeah, Tom, don't worry about it. It's it just felt casual. like a ringer situation. It was so funny. I was like, like nah, I don't play much. I'm like, oh. I'm like yeah, I'm, I'm, I said, I It was I like the play. perfect game. I got all the he, right cards <laughs> at the right time. I, and I, of course, I, I used them. I didn't hold back. It's you. <laughs> of course. He crushed me. Let's see. What else Andy? we got? More expansions for Survive? Definitely. Really? Yes. That's all I can say. Wow, that that's that's okay. Fine. Uh, let's see. Stronghold here. the game. Oh yeah, Ignacy. let's talk about Stronghold. Yeah, When's that coming out. That'll be uh, Essen. Um, I still haven't even seen the prototype for it, but I know he's w- very very hard at work at, at finishing it up. Very excited about that release. I mean, because you know the branding opportunity obviously is ridiculously good. Um, and um, while this isn't absolutely official, we should also have like an upgrade pack so that the first edition players don't have to like rebuy the game this, this, well, you know, said that live so i feel like that's official now. well it, it, we're going to really try to do that essentially we're going to really try to do that which is it's going to be card based so we can do that they there's going to be some stuff that they might not get because i think the board's going to be double-sided now i forgot exactly but uh, um you'll be able to play second edition rules 95 percent sure um with the with the first edition if you buy an expansion pack a upgrade pack all right, what go ahead and promote your podcast real quick. Board Games Insider. The best podcast not on the Dice Tower Network, because Tom will never... <laughs> Wait, to be on the Dice Tower Network, I should clarify this for people who are listening. You have to have at least... five episodes. Ten episodes. He said five for the longest time. All of a sudden he changed it because I started my own podcast. That but nothing to do with it. But we've been doing one every two weeks. We, we recorded one while we were here. In fact... In fact, Ignacy says to me that he goes, uh, I was told by Tom that I could get on the Dice Tower Network if I drop you. <laughs> he told me that. And I, I, and then that said, is true. I did tell him that. He, and he, he said that, don't worry, Stephen, I will never drop you. So um, it's called Board Games Insider. You can, you can go over. We have a guild, of course, where we're taking questions and using those for the uh, segments on the show. It's very short. It's going to be a, a half-hour show, you know, give or take a few minutes. Um, Three-segment show, news. Uh, advice for people who want to be in the industry and like you know what we're what we're doing at our companies of course that kind of stuff boardgamesinsider.com we have a website you can get us on iTunes as, as well if you want and then the rest of the, the plugs would be strongholdgames.com come over there to check us out follow me on Twitter at stronghold games Facebook slash stronghold games and uh, watch for the, the great stuff we're going to be doing this year because we have a, again another tremendous crop of games coming out thank you Tom All right, thank well, you it's so nice of you to have me on it's, Again, like two weeks in a, in a two week span, I've been on your show twice. This is pretty um, pretty impressive. The nice thing is, I can edit. edit. This later <laughs> this. Um, you can just take me the heck out. Well, um, for those of you, I know that it's sad that Eric Lang is not here and that you're stuck with this. But um, we, um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is, I'm actually not planning a live episode tomorrow at nine. I think there's a flea market at nine. Is it a nine a flea market? I would. I don't need more games, but I should at least, you know, look at them. Don't lie, you're going to be there, too. No, I'm not going to be there. You I are. don't go to the flea market. No, I, yeah. usually, I usually don't. No, it's we'll good. It's a, it's a good flea market. If but I, I can get Eric and or Alan Moon and maybe a couple other designers, there's some more floating around here. Um, I'll, I, I might do another show tomorrow. This may be the last one also, but Eric needs to be on. You want me to go get Eric? I can find him for you. He's, he's asleep. He, I can get him for you. you I know, don't I know. want this kind of... You know his room? No, but I know his number. <laughs> I know his number. I can get Eric. I know you're not important enough to get Eric Langer. I can get Eric here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Stephen Bonacore. And you've been watching <laughs> The Dice Tower. And let's shut this down now before you say anything else. <laughs>